Oh. Wow. I am not crying, you are crying. <laughs> Seriously, I love this whole soundtrack to this movie. I admit, it is like the best movie to come out in the last five years. So I will relinquish my man card to you right now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, welcome to Kensington. Uh, my name is Drew Daniels. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Uh, we are looking at, at a movie that's called The Greatest Showman in this movie, a series that we have that's called uh, Kensington Goes to the Movies. And The Greatest Showman is about a, a man whose name is P.T. Barnum, who's the inventor of the circus. And as a boy, P.T. Barnum was rather poor, and he was the son of a Taylor. And so him and his father went to the neighbor girl's house and him and the neighbor girl, they have a thing for each other. And it's at the very beginning of the movie that we see this scene where um, uh, the, uh, the girl's father will slap um, P.T. Uh, Barnum right in the face, you know, just shaming him. And it's just kind of traumatic moment that happens um, in the movie uh, where he, he realizes that he's poor. And so as he gets older, he ends up marrying uh, this girl who he was kind of flirting with. And they, he starts this wild and crazy dream of the circus is full of misfits and outcasts and people who are strange persons with unique abilities to the point where they're rich. And he buys uh, his wife, whose name is Charity, the house of their dreams on the same street that she grew up in. And eventually to the point where they're invited to fancy ballrooms because they had finally achieved success with the general public with their circus. And so the whole tension of this movie is the difference for P.T. Barnum trying to validate himself through his achievements, that he is trying to find fulfillment through his achievements. And I think for many of us, we kind of believe that our achievements in life is going to equal our fulfillment in life. And I think that the reason why is because we've experienced this is it feels amazing to land the promotion that we've probably put too much our hope in or worked too hard for. It feels amazing to graduate at the top of our class. It feels amazing to land the biggest client contract of, of the month and all of our team, that there is something that validates an emotion inside of ourselves from the thrill of actually achieving will bring us a sense of fulfillment and, and value and purpose, and it's undeniable. So we do find some fulfillment in our achievements. But what begins to happen is, once we maybe have validated ourselves, we begin to try to achieve people's love. We try to win hearts by how good that we look. And so we chase after all of these achievements to think, well, maybe I am as good as I think that I am. And so I need to prove it to myself and to the world. I need to have a sense of efficacy to know that I can do it. Or maybe I need to prove to the world that I am in fact worthy of being loved, that through my achievements, I am worthy of being seen and being known. That through my achievements, I am going to look for outward validation for something that is internally happy. That all of us, we're trying to win the love of others and maybe we forget the people who can love and fulfill us in our lives. When I was in high school, um, my sophomore year, it was a tragic, I, I had all of this acne all over my face. It was just this tragic case of acne and it spread to my back, to which the kids are calling backne these days. And uh, it took a long time for me to uh, lose my teeth as a kid growing up. And so my teeth were kind of grown over each other and my teeth are just really crooked. So I got braces on. So I was taking this medication and my skin was just drying up and it was flaking. It was like it was snowing on my face and I was like rubbing it. it was, and then I had like this braces coming on and I, it was like I took a nosedive off the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down, y'all. <laughs> and so I, I lied in waiting and I was a singer songwriter. And so I you know, sat in my basement and I played these hauntingly beautiful songs that described my teenage angst, as you do. <laughs> but I didn't wanna, as most of the kids these days, post it all over the internet and be like, look how amazing I am. No, I wanted to be lying in the wait. I was like a snake in the grass. And one day, bam, I'd hit everybody. They loved me. It'd be like, oh my gosh, Drew, I had no idea. So I laid in waiting. I wrote songs to the point of through junior year. And finally my senior year comes, I get my braces off. Oh, Guys, it's going down. I stop all the acne medication, my skin clears up. I'm turning, in, I'm turning out of my ugly cocoon into a beautiful butterfly. There's a, a talent show. Guess who's signing up? This guy. I go, I sign up, I make the talent show. I walk out on stage with the song that I wrote. Bam, y'all, snake in the grass, bam. Everybody loved it. I murdered it. I put it in a body bag. All the girls are like, oh my gosh, Drew, you're so amazing. I was like, I know. <laughs> to the point 
Next day, I felt like everyone was whispering around me like, oh man, who's that guy? Where did he come from? It's like, I know, I've always been here. To the point where <laughs> there was, I heard a voice behind me. They're like, Drew, Drew. And I turned around. And it was like the girl I had a crush on for a long time. And she's like, that was really good yesterday. And I was like, baby, it ain't no thing. You know, I mean, it's good. <laughs> you know, call me, you know. And that's how I met my wife, Natalie. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, not, it's not how we met. But for me, it was the beginning of my love to be on stage because, ironic, huh? It was the beginning of me to love being on stage because I felt like, man, I want to have significance. I want to have confidence in the fact that I have significance. I want to have a voice. I want to crusade for something. And so when I was in college, I, you know, I, I had given my life to Jesus. And I was like, I, I, I took my music and I started leading worship. And I was on, you know, worship leading stage. And, and I was like, well, no, that's not enough. I need the next stage. So I want to, like, share my story. I want to be, like, you know, talking. And so then I, you know, maybe share my, te- my story of my life. And then I was like, no, I don't want to be on that stage. I want to be in the stage where I'm leading, like, a ministry of some sort. So I came to Kensington and I was in high school and then I was like, that's not enough. I need to be on the auditorium stage, but that's not enough. I need to be in a stadium, but I need to be on the heavenly stage and the heavenly hosts are going to worship me. And I was like, wait, this is kind of backwards, isn't it? (laughs) Where I think for so many of us, when we begin to achieve, all of a sudden, come on, and you know this is true, you want to set a new finish line that you can get anxious about is the minute that we achieve one thing that fulfills us, we immediately switch our minds to feel like, well, now I have to go achieve the next finish line. That in fact, when it comes to our achievements, we spend more of our time chasing our achievements than we do enjoying what we have achieved. We spend more of our time in the process of chase and pursuit than we do in the enjoyment of that which is actually going to fulfill us. It was interesting, I took a a global trip to Dominican Republic this past spring, and I had some American guilt that I possessed because I was like, man, the rest of the world is in need or they have poverty, and we have all of these amazing things back home. And I spent a week there, and I was envious of their lifestyle because I realized As soon as I landed back in America, all of the anxiety that crept in because normal life was waiting for me, that I had all these finish lines that I needed to chase, and that maybe a more simple life of enjoying those who love you or enjoying our craft or our pursuits and maybe being able to chase some sort of purpose, maybe being able to chase some dreams, but not letting that be what validates us or creates value inside of us. And I realized that maybe I'm the one who has more anxiety And maybe I'm the one who's creating these finish lines that create anxiety. That you can achieve fame, you can receive admiration, and you can forfeit fulfillment. That chasing achievement, sometimes in different ways, will forfeit fulfillment of what's really been right in front of you the whole time. The relationships, the people, your faith. And many times we'll leave our family, friends, and faith to chase fame and fortune and adoration when maybe they've been there the whole time trying to fulfill you. But yet we need people to love us. And this is the story of P.T. Barnum. The P.T. Barnum, he, the the circus success wasn't enough for him. And so he actually invites a singer over from Europe. Her name is Jenny Lind. And he he brings Jenny Lind back into the, the country and they, he, he felt like the circus, everyone was criticizing him because it was fake and it wasn't real. And so he wanted to bring a real musician over because he wanted to, to impress those in the upper echelon. So everyone who's anyone from, from the high society comes to the show and the crowd is applauding this singer and he finds his validation. And in the movie, he's backstage and they're toasting to the performance and in walks his father-in-law and they begin to get into an argument And it goes like this, all of that money that you have and you are still just the tailor's boy. And so P.T. Barnum, this is the look on his face, as he's receiving a toast from all of the elite and upper class that he's still feeling unfulfilled. That you can achieve fame, receive admiration and forfeit fulfillment in the process of your life. Jesus in the New Testament, he was an amazing storyteller. He was actually what was called a rabbi, which means he gained a following through a lot of his teachings and his sayings. And some of his critics were people who knew a lot of the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. And so 
these people came in and, and they criticized Jesus because they didn't enjoy or particularly agree with who Jesus was spending his time with. They're like, man, this man, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And so Jesus proceeds to tell stories about things that are lost and how they're found. And so Jesus tells a story about a sheep that gets lost and that the shepherd will leave the 99 sheep to bring the one sheep home. And then he tells a story of a woman who loses, 10 co- or who loses a coin and, and finds it. And when they are found, there's joy and celebration and reconciliation and celebration and party and feast because what was once lost is now found. And so it's interesting, whenever Jesus is speaking to an audience, he always has a point. So he tells these two stories and he's not done. So he, fi- he finishes off with a story that maybe some of us in this, in this room are familiar with. It's a very famous parable. It's actually the longest parable that Jesus ever teaches on. And it's called the parable of the prodigal son, which some people actually believe should be called the parable of the waiting father. And it's about a man who has two sons. And many of us actually think that it's about, if, if you've heard the story, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit, but you've heard the story, many of us think it's about a son who's prodigal who runs away, but it's actually a story of two sons because he's speaking to a specific audience. And so this is where Jesus picks up the story. He says, and, and, and Jesus said in verse 11, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. We don't know why the younger son wanted to escape his father. Maybe the younger son actually wanted to achieve his own sense of independence. That maybe the younger son, he didn't like the rules of the father's household. Maybe how some of us, when, we, when it comes to our faith, maybe we don't like the rules that our father brings down and so we're not used to them, we don't like them. So maybe we want to achieve some sort of independence in our own faith. Now, we don't know exactly what he did over there. We can kind of find out later from some of his, his brother what he says that he actually spent it all a lot on, on prostitutes. But what the younger son is saying in the statement is he's looking at his father and he's saying, I wish that you were dead. In fact, it would be better if you died so that I could receive my inheritance, so that I could go and achieve my independence. The son prematurely asks for the blessing. I wonder how many of us, when it comes to our relationship with God, will prematurely ask a blessing of God so that we can achieve our destiny. I wonder if some of us prematurely go to God with our faulty character because we want to be validated somewhere else with a dream for our lives and we use God to be able to try to receive that validation and ask for this blessing. And this is what the younger son does. Continues on. However, in Jesus' story, we find that the, the, the father, he does something that maybe wasn't customary in this society, is that he actually relinquishes his power. As that he lays himself down, he actually gives in to the request of the younger son, and he gives him the money. No, it's an honor, shame society. Usually fathers that have hold on to their money. You know what's interesting, though, is I do find, and I would say this, is that sometimes... I believe that God might actually withhold his hand of blessing because our character is faulty, because we can't steward the gift that he wants to give us. But it's not in this story because there's something that Jesus wants to teach and he's going to reveal later maybe why God would allow someone, even in their faulty character, to go and live and achieve success without him. So it continues on. He said this, In verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey far into a country and there he squandered his property and reckless living. And once again, I said this earlier, but we don't really know exactly what he spent all of his inheritance on, but we do know from later from the younger brother that he spent it on prostitutes and he could have gambled it all away. I mean, he could have partied it all away. Either way, it was a large enough estate that was supposed to keep all of him and his brother sustained on their property after the father died. So he, he, went, he worked through a lot of different money in this process. And this is kind of where we find P.T. Barnum, is that P.T. Barnum, because he was so criticized by his father-in-law and he felt like the circus wasn't real, he decides he's gonna take all of his money that he's earned with the circus and he's going to invest it in a tour with this singer who he brought to America. And so they go on tour and in the process of this tour, 
The singer kisses P.T. Barnum on stage and it gets put into a newspaper for his wife to find out later. Additionally, back home at the circus, all of the riots didn't like the misfits and the outcasts and said that they didn't belong there. And so they set the circus on fire and he loses the fire, or he loses the circus in his building. And because he loses the building, the bank had to take his house that he had used as collateral. So he comes home to his wife who's seen this, but isn't mad because of the kiss because she's aware of his love for her, but she's mad because he lied. He's mad, she's mad because he lied about taking the risk together. That, he had always kept her in the loop and now he's done something without her. And he, she goes back to her, father, her father's house. And it's here we find that P.T. Barnum is sitting at the end and just is sitting alone at a, at a bar with none of his friends and none of the people. And it's what? The, the, the prodigal son and P.T. And PT Barnum, they learn the same thing. The many times or sometimes when we chase fulfillment, we forfeit fulfillment in other ways. It's the very act of leaving what could fulfill us to go and chase our dreams that will leave us homeless in our hearts. So the son, he comes, there's a famine in the land, it says in verse 14. And when the son had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. Now bookmark this, there's a famine in the country. And so the son, he gets hired by a citizen of the foreign nation and he eats the, or he feeds pigs and he's looking at the food and he wishes that that was his food because he's not even getting anything from anybody. And he comes to a realization, he says, he comes to his senses. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am perishing here with hunger. Now listen to this. When you forfeit fulfillment, and you chase after a different fulfillment. Many times we find ourselves in the famine. We find ourselves hungry that you can achieve the world. You can get all the promotions and you can have a famine and a hunger in your heart because you actually left fulfillment to go and pursue that's what, that what doesn't fulfill you. And so why would a father allow a son to go and chase his dreams. Why would a father allow blessing to come to those who are not in relationship with him? Because it's in the famine that you remember, come on, where you were fed. <laughs> that you were fed in your father's house. Come on, who in here is thankful that you remember where you need to eat? That fame will not feed you like the father will. That fortune will not feed you like the father will. The free and wild living will not feed you like the father will. Come on, who in here is thankful for the famine in your life that is reminding you where you are fed? That it's in your father's house where you get the face and in intimacy. It's in your father's house where you get the fresh bread of his word and promises in your life. It's in the father's house where you get the forgiveness of your sins. And so God will use sometimes the famine in our hearts to remind us of where we were fed. And so the son, he, he realizes, he comes to his senses and it says in, in verse 18 and 19, oh, hey guys, <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> it says in verse 18 and 19, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He prepares a speech. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. The hired servants, in his father's house, historically, had no job with the father permanently. Meaning that each of those hired servants were hired day to day. That the son, because of his failure, feels like he loses his sonship. And he needs to be a servant who has no guarantee of where his meal's gonna come from the day after. And he prepares a speech before his father. And I believe that many of us in this room actually, on the way, to church this morning, we prepared our speech of our own. Well, God, I know I've, I've been far from you, but this morning, if you could just really speak to me, and maybe you didn't say that out loud, but maybe you felt it in your heart. And you know that this is God speaking to you because I'm identifying you right now in these seats. <laughs> and then he's speaking to you, and then you're preparing your speech, and God, if you just show me and you break through the seeming nothingness today, then, then maybe I'll begin to serve you, and I, I will just lay down my life. 
But what's interesting is when he arises and goes back to the father, this is the attitude of the father. It says, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the, while he was still a long way off, that you don't have to be even in proximity to the father. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be put together. All you have to do is be heading in his direction. And a long way off, he'll come and get you. It says, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. It says in the Greek that the father fell on his neck. You know what's interesting? Is the father had no idea whether the son was gonna come back and ask for more money, if he was gonna rub his nose in it. But guess what? The father was just happy to see him. Turn to somebody next to you and say, he is just happy that you are here. He is just happy that you are here this morning. That it's not about being perfect or put together. You just have to be heading in his direction. That even in your car ride, as you are doing your speech to God, all you are doing is that he's just happy to see you because you're heading in his direction. And that's the nature of the God that we serve. It's, all, oh, it's also interesting in this story. This is so funny. This is so great. I love Jesus' storytelling. So the father was a prominent man, so he wore a long robe. So in this culture, it's actually shameful for you to run because what you have to do is you have to lift up your robe and expose your legs. And so the father's coming with his skinny legs, chasing you down. But you know what I realize is that sometimes when it comes to God, we might feel embarrassed. You might feel embarrassed here right now because of the way that your, your dad is running after you today, but he doesn't care because he's just happy to see you. And so when he finally proposes the speech, he says, and the son said to him in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it because my son who was once dead, he is now alive more than ever. What's interesting in, in this passage is that the ring that he gives him is another symbol of what you could inherit from a father's death. Meaning the father is saying this to him. He's like, I know that you wanted me dead before. I know you wanted your share of the inheritance now, but let me speed that process up for you because I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've come to ask for more money. Let me give a gift to you. And some of us in this room, we think that if we come back to God, that he's just gonna shame us. But rather sometimes, even if we've failed and we've had failure in our life, that God is gonna come back to us and he's gonna give us grace and he's gonna give us gifts. Come on. That he's, gonna, he's, a, he's a better father than we think that he is. And that there's not rejection, but there's a reception. There's a reception and joy and feasting and life. And this is what I believe we're learning today. We can achieve fulfillment when we are received by our Father is that the achievements that we have will only take us so far. And there's something about the person who feeds us. There's something about being received in love and in gifts and graciousness. That we can achieve fulfillment when we are received by our Father. You know what's interesting? What was the whole reason the son left in the first place? The son left in the first place because he didn't have relationship with his father. And he felt like it was rules. And he didn't like the way that rules was, but he never sat at the table with his father face to face, getting to know his characteristics and his attributes and who he was and his heart and what he has for him. And I think for many of us, we kind of feel the same way where maybe we have a misidentification of our father and his character. And I think many of us, we've used our heavenly father so that we can achieve and instead of trying to receive. And I think many of us have actually played church because we don't know what it's like to sit at the table and talk to our Father. Many of us in our prayer life, we're just like, oh Lord of the seven Sabbaths, I come before you today humbly. Lord of the new moon festival. It's like, what? You talk to your dad that way? I don't come to my father of, Father Michael, thank you for your seed and that I'm created and alive and well today. And thank you, Father Michael, for all of the lunches that you made for me. It's like, no. Having a relationship with your father is sitting down and saying, Ugh, 
Let me tell you about my day. Man, I really didn't like what that person said to me today. Here's what I'm really struggling with. And we never got to receive the unconditional grace and love and adoration that our Father just wants to give to us, regardless of the depth of our failure, is that our Father wants to restore us. And this is where we kind of find P.T. Barnum in our story. Is that P.T. Barnum, he comes to the end of himself, he realizes that all of his relationships was what was fulfilled him the whole time and it was standing there right in front of him. And so he actually passes over the circus to the beautiful Zac Efron. <laughs> and then he says, I need to go watch my wife and kids grow up. And so he leaves Zac Efron, hard to believe, ha, <laughs> kidding, to go be with his family. And he's sitting in a theater with his wife and there's this song that is sung at the very end, this is the last scene of the movie. And he says, it's everything that you ever want. It's everything that you'd ever need. And it's here right in front of you. That it was there the whole time. I think for many of us, we've failed to realize that we left a relationship to go pursue achievement. Man, but no, it was there the whole time. So actually, really fast before we kind of go into talking about the other part, because there's another part of the story where Jesus is still speaking to his audience. There's people who are there in this, in this story who are watching and hearing himself story, and he has a whole other thing to say to them. But before we do that, I would actually love to receive our offering. So we're gonna pause just for a moment. And maybe for some of us, we maybe went to God and we asked for a blessing and for him to provide or to, to provi to, for provision over our finances. And so this is a way to trust God and say, hey, I recognize this, this is from you. And if you are a guest here with us today, we wanna let you know that there is no pressure to participate in this money. We actually do not uh, want your, uh, we don't, this is not, we don't want your money. Rather, we want to meet you. So we actually have a gift for you that's out in our lobby. And so we'd love to meet you after that. So there's a whole other part of the story. And this is interesting because for many of us, if we don't identify with the prodigal son, maybe we can identify with the other son. And so in this story, as the son comes home and there's a party that's being thrown, the older son is busy working in the fields. He's loyal, he's hardworking. He doesn't even know his brothers come home. And so he goes and he hears the noise and he finds some servants and he says, what's going on? And the servants say, well, your brother was lost, but now he's back home. And the older brother gets angry to the point where the father comes out of the party to go talk to the older brother. Isn't that interesting though, that sometimes even in our anger, maybe against our heavenly father, that our dad will still come and pursue us anyways, but that's a whole nother sermon. So the older brother's sitting there and he says, come inside, come and celebrate because your, your brother who was once lost is now found. And the older brother looks at him and he says, no, you, I've been loyal and hardworking for you and I haven't even gotten a young goat with my friends to celebrate. And you bring out the fatted calf and he spent all the estate and property on prostitutes. And this is the response of the father. Remember the audience that Jesus is talking to. Many of us think that this is Jesus trying to stab his critics, but instead he's including them. And the father's heart. And he says this, and he said to them, son, you are always with me. And all that I have, all that is mine is yours. That all that I have is yours. And for some of us in this room, we are frustrated because we have been, we've been in the fields. We've been shucking corn for God. We've been pouring coffee. We've been going to Bible studies. We've been going to church. We've been performing and said, God, I have all these questions and I'm not getting the breakthrough that I need in my life. I'm not getting the blessing and yet someone's gonna get a blessing over here and I'm not gonna get you. How is that even fair? And the father's saying, no, no, no. All that I have is you. All that you have is really from me. You just never came inside. You were out in the fields and you never went inside to look at the face of your father and sit at the table and get to know him and to know that all that he has is yours. And I fear that some of us who haven't gotten the breakthrough, who have tried this and we hear words like, just be heading in God's direction, really? Because that's all I've been doing. Well, have you gone inside and received with the father? 
that you achieve your fulfillment when you are received by your father in relationship. That it was never about you working and achieving for God's love. It was about receiving the grace that he gives. There's a, a young woman who goes to our 1829 ministry. Her name is Rachel. And she had a Christian background in her life. And she got involved with a, with a guy and the relationship quickly turned abusive because of maybe his drunken behavior and then he wouldn't remember any of it. And when it ended, she kind of wanted to go try out life and got at a, went to a party and was, had, had some drugs and it kind of made her want to try this lifestyle to the point where one night she was actually sexually assaulted by a guy. And statistically speaking, one in every four women, one in three in sororities are sexually assaulted. And a lot of times what begins to happen is you try to, many women try to protect themselves from anything that could happen. But there's also another side where maybe you try to take control back because it's your choice and you wanna know that this is something that you decided to do. And so for her, she felt like she was a failure if she didn't bring a guy home on both nights of the weekend. To a point where it's maybe weeks or even months later where she brought another guy home and she was sexually assaulted again. And it was the morning that she woke up where she was in the shower because she was trying to scrub herself and she describes it like, I felt like I was trying to scrub my soul clean. And she grabbed a razor and was contemplating ending her life and to the point where she said, God, I need you to show up right now. And it was in that moment that God supernaturally showed up with his presence and his peace and love and poured it into her life and changed it. And she slowly made decisions to get her life back. And then she heard about this little church called Kensington and decided to show up and met some young people at the table and came to a Thursday night with our young adults and decided to show up and be vulnerable and then got involved in a small group and shared her story and was loved and received by all these girls to the point where last Thursday night, she shared her story to a room of 175 young adults and powerfully resonated with the hearts of many women who've experienced the same thing. And I think for some of us who are maybe sitting in shame or we've been violated in our lives, that we're waiting for, for God, but maybe we haven't come home. And it's not about you being perfect or put together. It's that you're heading in his direction and she was heading in his direction. And sometimes he will come out of the seeming nothingness. Then you just need to show your face above the hill and he will run towards you. And for others of us, we've been serving the whole time. And God has, he, he maybe once showed up in our lives, but now we just need to go inside to choose to be seen, to choose to be known, to choose to be vulnerable. It's interesting what I find when it comes to vulnerability in our relationship with our Father is that if I can't be vulnerable and honest with my Heavenly Father, I can't be vulnerable with people in my life. And that's what sitting at the table is, is there's a safety of honesty, there's a safety of knowing that you have a Father who wants to enjoy your company? Who wants to establish friendship and relationship? Who wants to establish a secret history with you that no one else knows about? Because that is the place where you achieve your fulfillment because you are received by the Father in relationship. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you and ask right now that those are some of us in, this, in the seats that we feel like we, we are at the bottom, that we, we recognize that there's a famine in our hearts, that we are empty and that there is a hole that we need to be filled And God. I just pray that we would begin to head in your direction, that our face would come over the hill. God, that out of the seeming nothingness, even to today, that you would break through, even right now, God, I ask that you'd break through right now to people who feel like they can't do it anymore and that they are not okay. And God, for those of us who feel like we've tried or we've done this, God, that we would just go inside. That's not about what we can achieve with hearing you or serving you or going on trips, but rather it's about receiving your love. It's about receiving your voice. It's about receiving your grace. It's about receiving the truth that your son died on the cross so that we may have life in you. And so God, let us receive you in this moment, in this act of worship that your grace is amazing and that it is in you that we can find all of our chains broken off and that we can be received in relationship by our Father. In your name.
Amen.